Hey, hello friends and welcome to Retro Portal Studio and in this video we're going to be taking a look at creating this nice elastic sidebar in Flutter which when pulled out creates this nice elastic effect. Let me show you again. So along with this elastic effect as we move the cursor inside the sidebar you can see that the right hand side of the sidebar flexes itself depending upon the position of the cursor. And as the cursor moves on any of the item in the sidebar the size of that item changes and also when we close the sidebar it closes with an elastic effect and when we open the sidebar you can see that the arrow shifts in the end let me just open this again and you can see the nice simple animation there so in this tutorial we're going to be talking about some of the relatively advanced concepts of Flutter UI and you can implement those concepts in your own ways in your Flutter applications so let's get started okay so right now I'm in a simple Flutter app in which I just have this my home page which is a stateful widget and in this stateful widget I have a scaffold which is covered by a safe area and it further contains a container and with the help of this container we're getting this nice gradient here along with this I have given a width to the container with the help of this media query that I have declared here in the build function so along with this I also have a stack as a child of this container and in the stack I have placed a simple material button that says hello world Along with this, I also have this assets folder in the application in which I just have a simple image which we're going to use as an image in the sidebar that we're going to create. So the way we're going to create the sidebar is by adding another child to this stack in the container. So for that, I just come down the center and create a new child that is going to be of sized box. And this sized box will contain the sidebar. So for this, I'm going to use a width property. And for this width, I'll come up here in the build function and create a new double and name this sidebar size and put this equal to media query dot width and multiply that by 0.65 so basically the sidebar is going to take 65 percent of the width of the screen so I'm going to use the same size here as the size of the sized box and next I'm going to add a child to this side box and this child of the sized box is going to be a stack and the reason for adding a stack here is going to be clear to you in just a few moments so in this stack I'll add a children property and the first child of this stack is going to be a custom paint. For this custom paint, I'll pass in the size property. And the size is going to be an instance of size class. And for this, I'm going to pass the width of sidebar size and the height of media query dot height. I'm just going to minimize the emulator. So other than the size, we also need to pass this a painter. And for this, we need to create a custom painter of our own. So if you don't know much about the custom painter and how to use it, you can check out my tutorial on creating a custom paint application in Flutter. And from that, you can get the concept of this custom painter and how to use that into your own Flutter applications. So for this painter, I'm just going to create a new class down here. And I'll just name this Drawer Painter. And this will extend Custom Painter. So this Custom Painter requires me to implement two methods. So here in the should repaint function, I'll just pass true and paint is the function in which the magic is going to happen. So first in the paint, I'll just create a new paint object and put it equal to a new paint. And by using the double dot operator, I'll just put the color and put it equal to colors dot white and also give it a style and give it a paint style of fill. The next thing that I need to do is I need to create a new path. So I'll just name this path and put it equal to a new instance of path. So to understand the path that we're going to create, I'm just going to give you a simple demonstration. Here in this demonstration, this black box is the screen of our app. And this dashed box is basically the drawer. So at this point in our application, what we simply need to do is we need to create this dotted box. And in this dotted box, you can see that we have four points here. That is minus width, comma, zero, width, comma, zero, width, comma, height, and minus width, comma, height. And width here is basically going to be equal to 65% of the screen that we have declared in the build function of our app. So basically we need to create a simple path and the path is going to start from minus width comma zero. It's going to create a line to width comma zero and then we're going to create a line from width comma zero to width comma height and then we're going to extend that line to minus width comma height and then we're going to close that path. So let's do that in code. So in the paint function we can get the width from this size property. And for creating a path, the first thing that I need to do is I need to create a point. And for that, I'll use path.move to, and in here I need to pass minus size dot width, comma zero. So after this, we need to create a line. And for that, I can do path.line to and pass in the second point. 
and like I presented to you in the diagram, the second point is going to be size.width, comma zero. From here, I need to create two more lines which are going to be simply like this. And at last, we need to close the path that can be done using path.close. So next, what we need to do is we need to paint this path on the canvas. And for that, we can use this canvas that is given to the paint function. And here, I can use canvas dot draw path and in this I simply need to pass the path and the paint and at this point I need to pass the instance of this drawer painter to custom paint so at this point if I run the app you can see that we have a nice custom painted rectangle where our sidebar should be and this rectangle basically extends beyond the screen which is currently not visible to us and the reason for extending this box is going to be clear to you by the end of this tutorial the next thing that we need to do is we need to make this custom painter react to the position of the cursor on the screen. And for that, we can wrap the stack with a gesture detector. So in this gesture detector, we need to use a function called onPanUpdate. And this onPanUpdate requires a function to which it gives details of the click. And the other property that we need to use is onPanEnd. And this also requires same kind of a function to which it gives the details. By using the onPanUpdate, we can get the user's click on the screen and then we can get the updates as the user moves the finger on the screen. And with the help of onband end, we can detect when the user clicks off of the screen. So what we need to do here is we need to get the position and put that in the my homepage state. For that, I'll just create a new variable in the my homepage state of type offset. And I'll name it underscore offset to keep it private and give it an initial value of offset of zero comma zero. Then in onpan update, I need to set the state and here I need to set the value of offset equal to details dot local position. And this local position will give us an offset that will be equal to the location of the user's finger on the screen. And this on pen update will also update us as soon as the user moves the finger on the screen and will set that value to the state also. And as soon as the user picks up the finger from the screen, we need to reset the value of offset to zero comma zero. So for that, in on pen end, I'll do set state, and here I'll set the value of offset to new instance of offset that is going to be 0, 0. And by doing this, we're keeping the track of user's finger's position on the screen. So to update the custom painter according to this offset, we need to pass this offset to the drawer painter. And for that, I'll come down to this drawer painter, and in here I'll create a new constructor and pass in the named parameters of this dot offset. And we also need to create a final variable of type offset, and I'll name this offset. Once this is done, we can go up to the custom paint, and in here I can pass in the offset property and put it equal to underscore offset. And I'll just minimize the emulator. Now, we need to use this offset to update the path of the custom painter. And to make you understand how to do that, we need to go to the diagram again. With the help of this diagram, you can see that up till now in our application, we have created a straight line from width comma zero to width comma height. But in actual application, what we need to do is we need to use a Bezier curve to create a curved line from width comma zero to width comma height. And we need to change this curve according to the finger's position on the screen. So to create a Bezier curve, we need to get a control point and an end point, which is going to be width comma height. So to get the control points for this Bezier curve, we're going to get the position of user's finger on the screen, and then we're going to map that position to get a new control point for this Bezier curve. To understand what a Bezier curve is and how to use it, I suggest you to check this article on Medium. In here, you can see that P1 is the control point, and P0 is the starting point, and P2 is the end point. In our diagram, the end point is going to be the bottom of the screen, and the control point is going to be this one. So by giving a read to this article, you can understand quadratic Bezier curve in a much better way. Coming back to the code, we need to remove this line here, and in place of this, we need to use a quadratic Bezier curve. And for this, x1 and y1 is going to be the control point, and for that, I'll just pass offset dot dx, that is going to be the x position, and for the y, I'm going to pass offset dot dy. We're going to change this x value soon, but for now, this is fine. For the value of this x2, I'm going to pass size.width. And for value of this y2, I'm going to pass size.height. And at this point, if I run the app and go to the emulator, you can see that we have this weird curve on the app. Other than this curve here, there's also another problem. 
If the cursor moves inside the sidebar, the sidebar flexes on the inside, and we don't want this to happen. We want the sidebar to flex only on the outer side. So for that, we have to change the value of the X control point of Bezier curve. For that, I need to create a simple function here. So the return type of a function is going to be a double, and I'll just name this get control point X. And this function also requires a double, that it will be the value of width. And in this function, I need to create a simple check. If the offset.dx is equal to zero, then we're gonna simply return the value of width. And this will fix the problem of curve that we have here. We also need to add an else clause. And in this, we need to return a conditional output. Here, we need to check if the offset.dx is greater than width, only then we'll return the value of offset.dx or else we'll return a value of width plus 75. And I'll use this function as the first argument of this quadratic Bezier curve. And in here, I need to pass in the value of size.width. So at this point, if I run the app and go to the emulator, you can see that even if I move the point inside of the sidebar, the sidebar doesn't flex on the inside. It always flexes on the outside and also the problem of the initial curve is gone. So we have solved the two problems that we had, but at this point, there is another problem. In case I have my cursor inside the sidebar and I move the cursor outside, you can see that there is a small moment of flicker. And this is because in case of this get control point X, we're checking if the value of offset.dx is greater than width, then we're passing the value of offset.dx or else we're passing the value of width plus 75. So initially, when the pointer is inside the sidebar, this value is given. But as soon as the pointer moves outside the bounds, the value changes to offset.dx, and this creates the flicker. So the solution for this problem is also a required feature of our application, because we don't want the user to control the flex from outside the bounds of the sidebar. So to solve this problem, what we have to do is we have to go up here in the gesture detector, and in the on-pen update, we need to check if the details.localposition.dx is less than or equal to sidebar size. I'll just minimize the emulator. And if this is true, only then we're gonna set the state to the new offset value. So basically we're checking if the position of the user's finger on the screen is less than the sidebar size, only then we're gonna set the value of offset or else we're gonna do nothing. So at this point, if I run the app, and go to the emulator, you can see that if I move the finger inside the sidebar, the sidebar flexes, but as soon as my finger moves outside the sidebar, there is completely no change. And if I lift up the finger, the sidebar moves to its initial position. So at this point, we have created the behavior that we want from our sidebar. In the next step, we need to add the content to the sidebar. So I'll just minimize the emulator. And for adding the content, what I'll do is I'll come below the custom painter and here I'll add a container. In the container, I'll add the height property and put this equal to media query dot height and also add the width and put it equal to sidebar size. Other than this, I'll also add a child of column. In the column, I'll set the main axis alignment to main axis alignment dot center. And I'll also set the main axis size and put it equal to main axis size dot max. In the children property, I'll add a container and in this container, I'll set the height to be equal to media query dot height and multiply that by 0.25. So basically, the height of this container is going to be 25% of the height of the screen. And in this container, I'll set the child property equal to center. And in this center, I'll put the child equal to column. In the children property of this column, I'll add a few elements such as an image and a text. After this container, I'll add a new divider and set its thickness to one. After the divider, I'll add another container. And for this container, I'll set the width to double dot infinity. With this width, the container will take the maximum width available. And also we need to set the height of the container. For the height, what I'll do is I'll create another variable and this variable is going to be of type double and I'll name this menu container height and put it equal to media query dot height by two. And I'll use this height as the value of height for the container. For the child property of the container, I'll add a new column. And in this column, I'll add the children property. And here I'll add five buttons. 
And each of the button comes from a stateless widget that we have created here that is called my button. And in this, I have simple properties like text, icon, text size, and height. So because we're having five buttons in the container, we're getting the height as one fifth of the total height of the container. And we're gonna pass that height to the my button. In the build function, I have this material button in which I have a row, in which I have the icon, sized box, and the text. I also have the on pressed function in which I haven't implemented anything. So the reason for adding container as the primary element of this column is because we want to get the position of each of these buttons. And for that, we're gonna be using the global key. And because it won't be a good approach to create five global keys, instead, we wrap all these buttons in a column and put that column as a child of the container. With the help of this, we will be able to get the position of the container and in relation, we'll find out the position of all these five buttons. To explain this, let's look at the diagram. So with the help of this diagram, you can see that for the total sidebar, we have this complete container. And in this, we have a column. And in the column, we have these two containers with the first container having the height of 25% and with the second container of having height of 50%. So in the second container, there are going to be five buttons. And for the each button, the height is going to be the height of second container divided by five. This approach is useful because for the final version of the app, we have to increase the size of these elements as soon as the cursor moves on them. So for that, we have to get the location of each of these buttons. For getting the location, we will be using the global key. So in case if we have added each and every element as a separate element to the column, we'll have to use five global keys. But in this case, we'll add the global key to this container and then we'll get the position of this container. And respective to this container, we'll get the position of all these five buttons. And then we'll use those positions to increase the size of these buttons as soon as the cursor moves on them. So let's get back to the code and implement this. So the first thing that I'll do is I'll come up to the my homepage state and here I'll create a new global key and put it equal to a new instance of global key. And I'll use this key in the container that has all the five buttons. I'll add the key property and set it equal to global key. Once this is done, we can use this key to get the position of this container and then relatively get the position of all these buttons. But before we get the position of these buttons, we need to create a list in which we have to store the positions. So for that, I'll come back up to the state and here I'll create a list of double and name this limits and put it equal to an empty list. So to get the position of all these buttons, we need to wait until the first frame of the application is rendered. And for that, we need to use a specific function. What I'll do is I'll override the init state function and in here I'll use widgets binding dot instance dot add post frame callback. And with the help of this function, we'll wait until the first frame of the application is built. And after that, we'll get the position of the container and then we'll find the location of all the buttons. So basically, we're waiting until the first frame of the screen is rendered. And as soon as the screen is rendered, we're gonna call a function here. So for getting the positions, I'll create a new function and name this get positions. And because we're gonna use this function in the on post frame callback, we're gonna give this an argument of duration. I'll just call this function here in the callback and in the get position function what I'll do is I'll use the global key I'll get the current context and use the find render object function and I'll store the results in a render box object once this is done I'll use the render box to get the location of the object which in this case is the container so I'll use the local to global function and in this I'll pass offset dot zero and I'll store the results in final position so basically, this is the position of container on the screen once the frame is rendered. So using this position and the height of the container will detect the starting and ending point of all the five buttons of the container. So for that, I'll just create a new variable and name this start and put it equal to position.dy and I'm gonna subtract a value of 20. And 20 is basically an assumption for the height of the status bar because the position will start from 0, 0, that is at the top of the status bar. But because we won't be counting any height of the status bar, I'm subtracting the value of 20 from the position that we have received from the render box. In the same way, I'll create a container limit and I'll put its value equal to position.dy plus renderbox.size.height 
minus 20. So in this case, I'm getting the position that is for the end of the container. For that, I'm adding the start position with the height of the container and subtracting a value of 20 for the same reasons we did with the start. Once this is done, I need to calculate the height of each button. So for that, I'll create a new variable and name this equal to step. And this will be equal to the container limit minus start divided by five because there are five buttons. After this, I'll create a for loop that looks something like this. And this I'm starting from the value of start and going to the value of container limit. And for each iteration, I'm increasing the value by a step. So basically, the first value is going to be the starting point of the container. The second point is going to be the end point of the first button. The third value is going to be the end point of second button. The fourth value is going to be the end point of third button and so on. And simultaneously, we're adding those values to the limits list. And also before the for loop, I need to set this list equal to an empty list. And after this, I'll call the set state function. And here I'll set the value of limits equal to limits. By doing this, we'll recall the build function and all the buttons will get refreshed. So the next thing that we'll do is we'll come down to the buttons. So here you can see that for each button, we have a constant text size of 20. But what we need to do is we need to check if the cursor moves inside the button and at that point, we need to change this text size to something else. So for that, I'll come up here and create a simple function. So this function will basically return a double value and I'll name this get size. And in this function, we need to pass the index of the button. So basically in this, I'll get the size and the value of the size will depend upon a condition. And the condition will look something like this. So basically we're checking if the Y position of the cursor is greater than the starting position of the button and is less than the ending position of the button, then that means that the cursor is on the button. And in that case, we pass in the size of 25 or else we'll send the size of 20. So I'll come down to the button and in place of 20, I'll use the get size function and pass in the index of zero because this is the first button. And I'll do the same thing for each and every button. At this point, if I run the app, you can see that there is an error of valid value range is empty. And this is because when the view is first is we can go to the init state function and initialize the value of limits and put it equal to a list of six zeros. Now if we run the app and go to the emulator, you can see that all the buttons are now visible. But if we move the cursor over the buttons, nothing happens. The reason for this is because in the get size function, we never return the size. So this was just a bug. And if I restart the app, you can see that the size of the buttons changes. And by default, each of the button is having a size of 20. And as soon as I drop the cursor and move over the button, the size of the button changes to 25. And as soon as the cursor leaves the button, the size reverts back to 20. And this happens for each and every button. And also, the right hand side of the side box is changing its curve value depending upon the position of the cursor. So at this point, we have almost completed the UI design. Now what we need to do is, is we need to find a way to close the sidebar. And that is what we'll do next. For detecting the open and close state of the sidebar, I'll create a new boolean called isMenuOpen and set it equal to false. So initially, the sidebar will not be open. And for animating the sidebar, I'll come down here to the sized box and I'll wrap the sized box with animated positions. For the animated positions, I'll add the duration property and set it equal to 1500 milliseconds. After this, I'll set the left property and I'll check if the is menu open is true. Then I'll set the value to zero or else I'll set the value to minus sidebar size plus 20. I'll set the value of top to zero. And I'll set the value of curves to curves dot elastic out. And at this point, if I run the app and go to the emulator, you can see that only a certain portion of the sidebar is visible. And this is because we've added the value of 20 to the minus sidebar size. But now we don't have any way to open the sidebar. In this case, what we need to do is we need to detect if the user has clicked on the side and dragged to the right hand side, then we need to open the sidebar. So for that, what we need to do is we need to go back to this on pen update function. And here we also need to add another condition. Here I'll check 
if the details dot local position dot dx is greater than sidebar size minus 20 because this 20 is the width of the sidebar that is always visible on the screen and if the value of this pointer is in that region and other than this if the distance dragged which can be retrieved by details dot delta dot distance squared is greater than 2 then what we'll do is we'll set the state and set the is menu open to true so at this point if I run the app and go to the emulator you can see if I click on it and drag the menu the sidebar comes outside now what we need to do is we need to find a way to close this sidebar so for that I'll add a simple arrow to the bottom right corner of the sidebar to do this I'll come down here in the stack and at the end of the second container we add another button so this is a basic icon button which is wrapped in the animated position and in here if we click on the button then this will set the is menu open to false so at this point if I run the app and go to the emulator you can see that we can click on the side and drag it and the sidebar comes from the left hand side and if we click on the button the sidebar gets closed I'll just open the sidebar again and you can see that the button itself gets animated and I click on the button and open the drawer again the button animates itself to the position so in the end this is the sidebar with nice fluid animations I hope you find this video useful and if you do please hit the like and subscribe button and also consider supporting me on patreon for all the flutter videos coming up on retro portal studio see you next time peace